Don Shanahan, mm-hmm. the film obsessive, the person who teaches us that every movie has a lesson. I do. Uh, we're here talking again, you and me, mano a mano, about mm. a movie, about a movie that that just came out that I just watched for the first time between yesterday and today, a film that is instantly in my pantheon of top films I have ever seen. Good. Uh, All right. Okay. A film that I really, until it, you know, was released on a 4K Blu-ray edition by Warner Brothers, plug, I guess. Mm-hmm. Thank um, you, Warner Brothers. Yes. Uh, the My only reference for it was a quick line from another favorite film, Get Shorty from 1995, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. where John Travolta is having an argument with someone about who played which drunk in which Western. And there was a reference to Dean Martin and Rio Bravo. For yeah. some reason, I don't know if it was Travolta's delivery, but that line has stuck with me like an earworm and it pops up every now and then. Now I finally have context. Mm-hmm. And I'm happy that tonight we are going to talk about Rio Bravo, Howard Hawks, 1959, John Wayne starring... Uh, Dean Martin co-starring, Ricky Nelson co-starring, <clears throat> mm-hmm. newcomer to the screen, Angie Dickinson <laughs> co-starring, yeah. uh, Western. Now, mm-hmm. had had you seen this film before? No, um, I was a first timer. Um, I, I I knew it's on a lot of lists uh, as a lot of top westerns, and it's you know uh, high in the pantheon, like you were saying of uh, of good performances and big team ups. Like I mean, Dean Martin was known for doing. You know, he had entered the movies and done the kind of the dual star thing because he's, you know, a popular recording artist and whatnot. But um, this was kind of like his first Western. And it was a big deal that it was that he was doing a quote unquote greedier part than just being, you know, the the lush that Dean Martin likely is and all the rom coms he did before this. So um, I knew this was a thing uh, that, you know, that Wayne was here and Dean Martin was here. And then the, uh, then the the specter that is Ricky Nelson and what his career was supposed to be or it kind of is i mean he had a very successful career i can't knock him for that but like this was that big coming out party for for um for a lot of different reasons and a lot of different ways but no i i had never seen it it had been circled in a lot of places um i don't think i ever like blind bought like own it owned it in any kind of format sometimes i'll do that with like a movie that i know is on a lot of lists and i just see it in a shelf i'll i'll pick it up with the intention of i'll watch that and then then it earns a place or should be here uh, but this one i never did um i'm uh, so yeah, this was, this was my first go around with it as well. Uh, I didn't watch it last night, but a couple of days ago and, but thank you for Warner brothers. Again, I will happily plug as well that, uh, we're in the place to be able to review some content that comes to home media and it's their whole hundredth birthday. It's, it's a worthy place to put there. And yeah. And I, f- <clears throat> I finally have a 4k Blu-ray player on which to admire this okay. film. I, I don't have the TV, but I don't know how that works. Yeah. I guess it upscales to, you know, I've got an HD TV, but it, you know, it's kind of old, yeah. um, but it still looks great. It pops. Oh, yeah. And, you know, this, this is the, one of the rare times when I see like in Technicolor where I'm really <laughs> like blown away. I mean, all yeah. of the outfits, the costumes in this movie, you could watch the, the entire, the entire two hours and 20 minutes mm-hmm. with the volume off and just look at the costumes. You sure could. Yeah. It's <laughs> oh my exceptional. gosh. They're so vibrant. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, um, what's your like? I don't know if we've ever talked about this on other shows we've done together. What's kind of your temperament or your um, I don't know your your penchant for westerns? Like, are you a western guy? Did you experience them a lot? Are you digging them in now? Like, what's your western history? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that question. Yeah. I know this wasn't planned, but I'm. This is a great, great way to get into it. We we will talk about the movie, folks. I yeah, promise. But we're, but this we're is dipping our toe in the water, right? Right. Um, it, I, my history with Westerns is kind of the same as my history with musicals. Um, you know, I did not really get into them until probably the last 10 years or so. Um, you know, my only real experience with Westerns that I can remember is in high school, I took a film class and our teacher showed us the wild bunch and that Mm. kind of changed my life. Uh, you know, I, I I love that film. Yeah. Yeah. it's, It's amazing. But the from what I understood from watching that it was you know Sam Peckinpah this is like 1968 mm-hmm. 69 yeah, very, so it's kind of way term one yeah right but it's kind of way past the western heyday and it's sort mm-hmm. of commenting on 
the transition of like from the old West into modernity, like you had things like the machine gun at the end and all that. So it was a metaphor mm-hmm. for what's going on in America, yada, yada, yada. So I was like, yeah, it's great. It's a beautiful bloodletting as one of the critics wrote at the time. Um, but I didn't feel the need to go back and watch those other Westerns because I had it in my head. Oh, they're cheesy. They're old. You know, John, John Wayne, you know, everyone has a John Wayne impression. So it just yeah. it just seemed like something I wasn't interested in. I was I was a Tarantino high schooler, sure. you know, right. watching right. all these things, right? Um, but yeah, and musicals were the same way. It wasn't until I started seeing these sort of irreverent or you know, uh, I guess later stage commentary musicals that mm-hmm. I really start. I understood the form and I kind of got into it. Um, you know, I I hate to bring it up, but La La Land was very instrumental. I know people are very divided on that one. I love that movie, same. but you know, I. I got to see Singing in the Rain for the first time mm-hmm. like a year or two ago. Again, yeah. another one of these kind of studio, you know, big anniversary releases. And I had no idea. Well, I think I'd seen a stage production earlier, but I kind of didn't remember it that well. Mm-hmm. But it was like it's a movie. It was a musical about Hollywood. And I'm a sucker yeah. for movies about the movies. So it's great, you know. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, Westerns, I've in the last few years, I've watched, you know, I've watched a few John Wayne films. I think I did see the searchers a long time ago, Mm -hmm. Um, but I generally like them and I get nervous talking about them because a lot of what struck me about, say, Rio Bravo are things that I was not expecting, but maybe they are staples of the genre. I'm just not aware of because Mm. I'm not, you know, I don't have the wide breadth of knowledge. Um, So let me turn that back on you, Don. What's your history with Westerns? Are you you like a Western expert? (laughs) No, no, not by any means. But um, I um, I probably have. I've dabbled with them longer for sure. Like I, um, I was in a, I grew up in a more conservative country boy, gravel road farm place where the Westerns I caught more often than not were probably the television stuff more than anything where that was the gateway, the, the easy stuff that was a half hour on television, whether it was like the rifleman or, or some of those you know, just cheesier shows that were on reruns at the time that are on like me TV now, you know? And um, so I, in terms of movies, at my youth, it would have been like the tail end of like of Eastwood doing his thing where when he came back for Unforgiven, that was kind of that watershed thing where I know that was one of those movies that I got set down to watch. Like, hey, this guy right here, he's important. You need to see this. And like, this is him coming back to what made him great and whatnot. And I guarantee that movie flew over my head at the time. But I've realized like obviously like many other people where Unforgiven is kind of that thing where it was – um it was that revisionist Western in the nineties, definitely past his heyday, but talking to that old era. And it's led me to little dips here, little dips there where I'll, I'll dive into a rabbit hole of like a two or three Westerns at a time and catch a few where the ones, and I kind of just went straight to some of those, you know, those um, well-heeled lists where like the searchers was, was like one you're supposed to, I, I went through the ones you're supposed to see list and I'm still digging through them now, including this one. Like, um, but like the one that's kind of stood the test of time for me, where like that one, one that spoke to me and is like in my top like ten of all time uh, favorites, it, or close is um Shane. Shane's the one that gets me every single time. So, um, I that's that's one I need to watch. I've not yeah. seen Shane, but um, but the Wayne stuff. Um, I've done like Stagecoach. I've done uh, oh, not ma- less than I realize because like it's it's kind of this and then well then the Searchers. But and that's kind of the the bridge that brings us back to Real Bravo where searchers was four years before three years before this where after he was done with the searchers with houston he kind of said he was going to swear off westerns for a bit and kind of like expand himself as an actor and not be typecast (laughs) crazy enough because that's exactly what he was but like he wanted to kind of not go you know not go back to the western well every single time when he needed an easy hit or a paycheck um, whereas I heard when I read some history on this one with Rio Bravo with Hawks, where he admired Hawks, but at the same time, he's like, God, he's like, I am trying to not do a Western. I'm trying to expand my, my horizon, show that I'm a real actor. I'm like, but I think somewhere along the line between probably vices and his, his lifestyle, I need a paycheck and an easy hit. And you get one every time he puts a cowboy hat on. So yeah, this was the right place to be. You team him up with a proven talent that people go see like Dean Martin in his heyday. He was like 42 when he made it and then you throw in the young kid that everyone's impressed by where if there's a young generation who because this is 1958 you know 20 almost 20 years after stagecoach where if he's gonna if wayne is introducing himself to a younger generation through the love that everyone has for ricky nelson at the time like this this expanded his career he would he would ride this another 11 years to the shootest and 
True Grit would come in here in 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 eleven years in sixty nine, and like that. As much as he said, "Oh, I need to be a better actor," he kind of found a way to be a better actor within his bread and butter of westerns because he shows stuff here, and then we see it later. Where by the time you do get to, um, yeah, the shootest, and you get to True Grit, he's he, yes, it's John Wayne. Yes, he's putting the cowboy hat on, but he's showing us something different, much in the way that we probably talk about Harrison Ford today. Like Harrison Ford is at a point where he's playing himself, but he's so compelling as himself that whether he's the Rick Deckard version of himself, the Indiana Jones version of himself, or whatever, we're kind of there for it. Same thing with De Niro. De Niro's the you know Italian tough guy, but is he the Italian tough guy of Meet the Parents, or is the Italian tough guy of the Irishman? Where you could be really good at your little niche and still show nuances, which Wayne gets to do. Yeah, very well yeah. said. I, I do want to mm. go back and correct the record because I know okay. there are people typing at us right now. Uh -oh. You mentioned the searchers. You would mentioned Houston, possibly John Houston. That was John oh, Ford. Ford. Gotcha, gotcha, John gotcha. Ford. Yep. Okay. Okay. <laughs> One correct. of the few things I, I know that. about. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, I it was a few years ago. I think it was Olive Films. Maybe I don't. Wanna, I want to get that wrong, but they had put out um, some retrospective Blu-rays of the Cavalry trilogy with John mm. Wayne. Um, mm -hmm. She wore a yellow ribbon. Um, or no, it was, yeah, and uh, Fort Apache, I think Rio Grande. I believe I talked to Fowley about those. Yeah. Um, but these were, you know, 10 years or so before uh, Rio Bravo. Mm -hmm. And it was very much in that kind of regular John Western, John Western, John Wayne, might as well mm -hmm. call him John Western because he's synonymous. Right. Um, and, and they were all very surprising, very good, you know, pictures. I, oh, sure. that's the thing. That's the thing about my preconceived notions. I think these are sometimes things that even stick with us and permeate the pop culture. Uh, just th they kind of get in there and they, they stick around whether or not they're true was that they were kind of stodgy and corny and you know, a little bit racist and, you know, just <laughs> like problematic yeah. as they say. But if you go back and watch them, you can definitely understand that. Yes, they're definitely products of their time, mm -hmm. but there's a lot more depth and richness of, of character and, and history um, than people might the very, very uh, modern movies being made, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago. Very right. surprising. I I'm think, with you where um, yeah. I haven't seen a bad. I mean, I haven't seen a bad Western yet from and I know I'm dipping from the top of the list, but like you can call them as stock as you think they are described in the way they were made or the tread on the same places or they look maybe look and shoot the same. But like, I don't know, in each one I watch, there's enough nuances where like, ooh. This has me interested and I'm there for it. No matter which one, if it's the ticking clock of high noon or it's the, the father, the, the, you know, the absent, the father figure angle of Shane or, or even just the, the drunk, you know, reliable partner thing going on here in this one. Uh, there's always just, it may all look the same and they all color the same. And, and yeah, the villains and the tropes are all there, but whatever it is, each person who makes one, especially these top tier ones, there's enough something that that it it stands out enough that it i would trade these movies for oh my gosh a dozen that are made today where you can just read every tea leaf every single step of the way where even this one i'm not saying this is suspenseful by any means but like just the the investment is compelling enough that it keeps you whereas we i don't know today we have paper thin characters or maybe that everything is over exposition where it's told to us instead of shown to us and we there's nothing to sink your teeth into today versus this one where, you know, man, a few words conveys things by body language and presence. And yeah. Well, and I think, you know, that's that was another kind of stereotype is, you know, I always thought John Wayne was kind of like the strong, silent type, but he talks a lot. He, does. You know? he truly does. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think he's great. And one of the things and this this is a good gateway into Rio Bravo. I'm glad mm -hmm. you mentioned High Noon because that was another one I got to watch a few yeah. years ago. You know, Gary Cooper just rules that movie. It's again, it's another like you were saying, it's something you could put on screen today. Mm -hmm. And if if you were to just say, look, I'm going to pay you a hundred dollars. I'm going to fill up an AMC theater, promise everyone a hundred dollars to watch this movie. Uh, and if you love it, you don't get the hundred bucks. If you hate mm -hmm. it, we'll give you two hundred dollars. Right. I guarantee people will be coming out. Some of them will probably be lying because they need the money. Yeah. yeah but yeah. I, I guarantee people will be people will be talking about this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but Rio Bravo. Uh, first of all, the first character we see on screen is Dean Martin, mm -hmm. and I am not familiar with Dean Martin outside of like iconography of the Brat Pack and you know kind of that. I did not recognize him because okay. he's. He's, you know, kind of gaunt. 
He's got mm-hmm. this haunted like look on his face. He's you know got like nine o'clock shadow. Oh, and yeah. he's kind of stumbling into this bar. Uh, he's broke, but he's got that drunk, you know, that drunk's itch. He, he sees a guy um, who turns out to be the, the heel of the movie mm-hmm. um, at the bar who's you know got a bottle and poured himself a shot. And he's kind of like looking at him like, oh, oh you know, hey, you want to help a brother out kind of thing? Mm-hmm. The guy flips a flips a dollar piece into a spittoon yeah. and wants, uh, wants our hero dude, a.k.a. Borachon, which is Spanish for drunk. <laughs> Perfect. And Dean Martin to go digging for it. And, you know, a fight ensues because uh, our main hero, played by John Wayne, uh, Sheriff John T. Chance. That's that's a Western sheriff's name if totally. I ever heard one. Oh, yeah. He kind of, you know, get they, they get into a skirmish. Uh, there's a fight in which one of the uh, you know, p- patrons at the bar gets shot by our villain, mm-hmm. which is murder right there in front of everybody. Right there. He gets taken to jail. Thus, uh, kicking in the main plot of our film, which is he is a he is a heavy uh, mm-hmm. Joe Burdett and he's got a posse in town and he's got way more people throughout the country. It seems that will come uh, if the price is right. And if the big boss comes, says, hey, come get me out of a, a pinch. Yeah. So we've got essentially two: the sheriff, his drunk former deputy. Uh, to hold down the fort against uh, this this band of bad guys. Yeah, you got the one. Next... Old, you got one more crippled old man who's like oh third. stumpy. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> stumpy but that that's your backup. God. You know, good luck. Yeah. Right. He's he's kind of an old, you know, broken down, but very spirited. You know, he's got like all of two teeth in his whole head, but he's got a great, yeah. you know, old coal miners or you know prospectors kind of voice. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, the next day, um, guy named Wheeler comes into town with a with another group of men. They're just kind of passing through. But mm-hmm. uh, and there's a young kid named Colorado who's probably like all of it, 19 years old. Right. Long story short, because it's a two hour and 20 minute movie. This, this movie is a mm-hmm. long one and there's a lot going on in it. But it boils down to Colorado, Stumpy, Dude and Chance are trying to keep Joe uh, Burdett in the jail cell for mm-hmm. a week. Because that's how week. long it's going to take for a federal marshal to come down and arrest yeah. him and take him off to wherever. In the meantime, you got all these bad guys coming into town. Mm-hmm. Also, his you've brother, got this, yeah. yeah, his brother Nathan, who comes to yeah, try yeah. and bail him out, not bail him out, but break him out. Mm-hmm. And then you've got Feathers, played by Angie Dickinson, who is mm-hmm. sort of a a passing through this you know one horse town uh, con woman. Uh, she and uh, Sheriff Chance fall in love. Of course they do. Oh boy, uh, yeah. Um, but, you know, she's kind of she's kind of spunky. She's, you know, been making it in the West and on her charms and her cunning. And mm-hmm. she ends up kind of becoming the fifth member of this posse. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it's it's a really the, the thing I love about this movie is I thought it was going to be another high noon situation. Right. There is this this seven days, this ticking clock. I thought, OK, mm-hmm. day one, they have to fight three bad guys. Day two, yeah. they've got to fight like seven. And then like yeah. by the time day seven rolls around, you're going to have the federal government coming in mm-hmm. and then you're going to have an army of bad guys and all this other stuff. It's not that. No, most luckily. of this movie is a very touching Mm-hmm. surprisingly sophisticated yeah drama about you know guys bonding dealing with addiction because you know basically dude has to kick alcohol in order to to be of any use to this mission um and you know romance the it's a little bit eye rolling because you've got Angie Dickinson and John Wayne getting together because it just feels like it's you know contractual yeah. kind of yeah but she's, she's 27 he's 51 yeah it's uh definitely a may december situation oh yeah 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 of two different years (laughs) how however i loved watching their dynamic i didn't quite care that it's a flimsy like how they you know that they got together yeah but i love their interplay because she makes him so uncomfortable because Mm -hmm. as we're kind of talking about he's not necessarily a man of few words but he's definitely kind of an uh, an old west man's man he's not used Mm -hmm. to talking about his feelings especially with like a woman he'll open up to his guy friends and get stuff out of them But he's like she's putting on like uh, the last scene, a, a scantily clad kind of outfit because she's going to go downstairs and perform for the guys. He's like, I, I don't want you doing that. She's like, mm-hmm. why not? Tell me you love me, essentially. Right. 
but yeah, th this movie it, it works as a drama and it's punctuated by these little, you know, skirmishes here mm -hmm. and there. Mm -hmm. And it ends in this pretty spectacular climax that reminded oh, yeah. me a lot of the end of the wild bunch. Yes. But it doesn't not to give it all away because I think people should definitely watch this if you haven't. But it doesn't end exactly the way I thought it was going to. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure about you. No, same. Um, I think a lot. I think, like you said, I think people are expecting certain beats to happen in a Western where it, it's it's like you said, there's either going to be between the skirmishes and the battles and the, the set pieces, so to speak. Like you're expecting like some guy time, some, you know, bust each other's balls time, maybe small comedy. Who's going to be your side character that comes in and just keeps the plot moving with little gags or this or that. And for a while there, you wonder if that's going to be the, the Mexican restaurant owner here in this movie. We're like, is he going to be the guy that just kind of keeps things chipper while we're waiting for the next gun battle to happen? And it doesn't turn into that. Um, and at the same time, I think a lot of people are expecting like most Westerns, whether it's a TV show or a movie, you're right. That big battle scene to kind of be whatever it's going to be. And then uh, a big wide shot and some credits where there's not a coda that could come in and just kind of tell you, Hey, like, Gun battle wasn't the whole thing here. We still have more. We still have to propel our characters forward. And this movie has a very well one along the way, like you've already said, like this is in right where you're saying a legitimate drama about feelings and manliness and stature and image, whether it is the, um, the like you said, the the beating, the kicking of addiction when it comes to Martin or the acceptance of uh, a friendship that you know that wayne portrays to martin at the same time and then the you know the kid looming where you have that mentorship angle but it's not that invest the whole movie in the whole like hey we need to bring colorado along and where he's there tagging along every scene like some puppy dog learning the ropes like it's never that he kind of actually in a way kind of comes into the story just young and ready to go like oh the kid can shoot and, and he has actually really good judgment about when to shoot and when not to shoot and how to like i love the way he kind of like diffuses the gambling situation when we first meet feathers where a different kid would be we we would we would lean on youth and naivety there where colorado comes in kind of morally sturdy and ready to go which most westerns wouldn't do that you you would do the young you would do the naive little but you know buckaroo angle so for this movie to have the amount of like you said drama the healing the emotional talks like and it's not campfire regret stuff it's forward moving stuff and then you got a coda after the big battle where this does set itself apart compared to most westerns in a very very positive way where i'm, I'm glad i saw it i'm glad i get to compare this next to other things it's great and you know we talked about we infamously talked about barbie earlier this week <laughs> we sure did sure did or, or last week at the, at the time this goes yeah. up and i think you know beyond barbenheimer i think Rio Bravo is a better companion piece to Barbie because we get a lot of in mm. Barbie, you know, okay. the kind of like what, at least from a certain perspective, what makes women tick? What is their view of the world? Yes. How does the world view them? And how do they kind of view themselves within these various sometimes contradictory paradigms? I feel like Rio Bravo is a fantastic consolidation of you know, it, yes, it's you know 70 years old or whatever, yeah, but yeah, there yeah. are some things that are just kind of like true truer truisms that just kind of reverberate throughout the generations and i think that the if a woman is trying to understand like what makes a guy tick or mm -hmm. why won't he talk to me and you know what what do guys talk about when they get together yeah i think this is kind of a good dissemination of that we talk to each other differently we we open up about our feelings that's kind of like a cliche like my, my sure. man doesn't ever talk to me about his feelings i'm like well you know, we don't talk necessarily about our feelings the way that women talk to each other about their feelings mm -hmm. we talk about them the way guys talk about our feelings which cuts just as deep and the, totally. the, the bonds right. are just as solid but it's yeah. just it's a different kind of delivery and and that really comes across in several of these scenes i i'm surprised dean martin was not nominated for something in this movie because this uh, is a john wayne film up. but this really is yeah. dean martin's movie you're gonna make me look up the oscars of this year while we're digging and talking um the other thing i like about where this is going in terms of like um like you're saying with the barbie comparisons or the portrayals that are here is that um is that what you have going here is dickinson's character of feathers like remind me if i'm wrong here i don't think she's ever a quote-unquote damsel in distress either like no. she's a forthright woman who knows what she wants says what she wants and could have just as easily left this town in the moment that she did if she wasn't screenplay wise smitten enough with john t chance where i think in in lesser movies she is or there's a love triangle 
uh, it's either love triangle or damsel in distress. Um, who's going to get the girl? And we, we know <laughs> from the first moment, nope, this one's for John and it's going to happen that way. How we get there is the journey of this one for sure. I'm, I hadn't even thought about love triangle, but you're right. There's another universe where Colorado, the young upstart kid would try and be getting with, with exactly. feathers because she'd yeah. be like, he, he'd be like, look, that old man, he could be your grandfather. I'm, I'm uh -huh. the young buck, you know? Yeah. Um, but you're right. And, I'm glad you brought up the damsel in distress thing. And again, mm -hmm. I have not seen nearly as many Westerns or, or old timey entertainment, but I have been watching a lot of older movies in the last few years. And I'm kind of searching for a lot of these cultural cliches that we hang our hats on. Okay. And in terms of the Westerns I've seen, I have not seen this archetype. You know, the, 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 the woman who's like tied down the railroad tracks and she's so yeah. helpless. I've seen, much is that a cartoon many, thing at this point then well but but that's every popeye episode you know what i mean like right yeah. but i'm um, people talk about and this is they talk about like westerns as a genre as mm -hmm. if there are any women in them they're being rescued i've seen mm -hmm. several more westerns where if they're they're not necessarily you know out there shooting rifles alongside the guys right but they're not just like i'm so helpless come rescue me yeah partially because i think the people who made these films understood that and it kind of goes back to your Ricky Nelson thing mm -hmm. uh, and, and the Colorado character. You can't be the naive kid and True. survive on the frontier. These were like hard bitten, hard times. Mm -hmm. We have no concept of what it was like to grow up at right. that time. You're not, you know, someone busts into a door and says, you're coming with me. She like the hell I am going to get a pot thrown at your head. Right. Um, a I, movie like Johnny Guitar has a very strong, yeah. you know, female centered presence in it. Um, and that's what I, I think, liked about Angie Dickinson here. She's tough. I think the trope that maybe shows up more instead of the damsel in distress thing is the nervous woman at home. Like that I've seen a ton more often. Like the searchers is one of those where like, unless it's the, the girl who was kidnapped, who's the, the thing we're chasing. The yeah. women are just, the women are just at home holding down the fort while the men are on their tireless search for justice and, re and retrieval and whatnot, where and like Shane, when you get to Shane, the women in there are, uh, the, the woman the woman of that story is at home obviously she's the the tough one who runs the house and therefore is the boss but at the yeah. same time there's half a love triangle attempted or hinted at in shane where it, it the home the homestead part is probably the bigger trope than the damsel in distress part well but, but, but here's advised. the thing well but here's the thing like if you're trying to capture what life was like at a certain point yeah. in american history it's not a trope. It's just, you know, necessity. Mm. It would True. look really Thank strange you. if you had, you know, uh, a movie where the woman is like, you know what, I'm just going to leave the kids behind and come out with you and hunt for our kidnapped niece or whatever. It, it yeah. just it kind of makes sense. Someone's got to be there to hold down the homestead. And I'm not suggesting you're saying this, but the, the cliche kind of bothers me because it's like, oh, mm. she's just going to be the homemaker. I'm like, do you understand what it takes to run a home? Exactly. You have yeah, to be tough. Then. You have to be smart. The guys who are going out there, you know, they might be great at tracking and hunting, but mm -hmm. you ask them to, to chase kids around and do, and do the washing, I guarantee they'll be crawling out of their skin. That's right. You're like, I, this, I don't know what's going on here. Please, someone come save me. I'm tied to metaphorical yeah. railroad tracks. <laughs> I, I think the other depiction that I feel like is revolutionary in this movie, or at least above above the tropes, is, is Martin's portrayal. Like, yes. do we get a lot of, I mean, this is 1958, where we're in that parallel to this, we're in post-James Dean, we're, we're past Rebel, Rebel Without a Cause, we're past uh, East of Eden, stuff like that, where the angsty, um, how do we show depression, how do we show um frailty in men or vices in men that that that's that seal's been broken a little bit in more contemporary things but to to have dean martin be the drunk of the movie but a true dealing with demons that that aren't going to be cured by this one week of the movie like yeah he gets himself right and he cleans himself up in time for the big battle but by no means is he perfect and is he okay um like that portrayal i think in lesser movies where I'm not saying it's like drunken master Jackie Chan stuff, but like he's likely a whole lot lighter or he's the, the butt of it. I mean, he's the butt of bullying, but he's not the butt of jokes and he doesn't make jokes of himself. It's there's, there's true torture demons there. And I think uh, for this Western to, to lean on that and put that on your second build star uh, and, and the guy who's your comedy guy, your, your everyone's heartthrob Italian love song singer. 
for him to come in here and do that is it's a, that's a mighty big thing. Um, I did look up those Oscars for you. So this was the year of um, this was the year of Ben Hur, which swept in one like 13 Oscars. So best supporting actor that year was Hugh Griffin playing the Sheik in Ben Hur. You had two stars from Anatomy of Murder, Arthur O'Connell and George C. E. Scott. You had the long, young Philadelphians of young Robert Vaughn, and then Edwin, who played um, I think the this would be the um, yeah the caretaker of Diary Van Frank, like the homeowner where they all hit. Mm. So um, yeah, and then John Wayne's not sniffing best actor in a year where it's Heston room at the top Lawrence Harvey Jack Lemon and some like it hot which is a huge part for him and then Stewart in an enemy of murder so yeah you, this is a year where you just run into the buzzsaw that is called Ben Hur and then you've got room at the top you've got an enemy of the murder you've got the 400 below is like this was a year like yeah and yeah. and the quaint western is just not going to play quite there so and you know that's it's unfortunate it um, is I, I do. Yeah. I know this got some like I know Dickinson. I think Ricky Nelson actually won like Golden Globes for like best newcomer performers yeah, yeah, and all that stuff. So uh -huh. It did get some some love. And um, it was this was somewhat of a box office success. I think oh, totally. um, I think I think Hawks had said that he attributed a lot of that to Ricky Nelson's. Oh, uh, yeah, this was you the know, heartthrob presence. wagon here. Yeah. But that's the that's the great thing okay. is like yes he's a heartthrob and yes it's a bit distracting when he's like the one guy in the movie with Elvis hair you know yeah. he, he looks like yeah. he walked in off a of 90210 not wearing but a hat is, yeah yeah <laughs> right but but he is there is something kind of almost contradictory about his character he's the young kid who's kind of like following orders of the the guy who's in the front of the pack but then when he's kind of left on his own to be in this town mm -hmm. he's just kind of hanging out he pops up every once in a while you get the feeling that he's got his own life to live and he's kind of sure. he joins up with this group because he wants to help not because like it's a desperate hour or you know hey we got to get the kid in here yeah but going back to dean martin mm -hmm. the thing i loved about uh the dude is we get like maybe even two sort of character arcs in this movie you know we see him as the, the opening scene of like the the, the wild-eyed you know town he's in the bar like he uh he had gotten arrested and sent away because he killed those kids with those pills and mm -hmm. then people are spraying him with seltzer and he could just see he's completely like out of it and humiliated. We get that with Dean Martin here, yeah. but he does get a second chance to come and kind of like be the hero and he gets deputized and he's once again, the, this, the kind of the man in the saddle, he's trying to prove himself, but then he gets attacked by Burdett's men. When they come into town, they, they, they kind of do the old switcheroo. They beat him up. They shove him at a bar and they steal his clothes to try and, you know, make an assault on the jail. Yeah. He's cool completely, too, he, by the way. Yeah, it is. It's a great scene, especially yeah. the way that it's, uh, it, it resolves itself with mm -hmm. the flower pot distraction. And then John Wayne, like taking his rifle and shooting a guy off his horse, like from across town. <laughs> practically. Oh, I know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, super awesome. awesome. Yeah. But the dude, as he's, as Dean Martin's character is called, he's humiliated and it drives him right back to the bottle and yes. you know is his best friend uh sheriff chance is like you know well you know what if you want to quit that's fine stumpy will get you a bottle you can crawl back into your hole i'm just gonna uh, i've got other plans and he deputizes colorado the kid yeah. and that's what it takes it's like wait a second you're gonna let this kid take my place i mean i i was good right is he as good as i was mm -hmm. and you know, it's it's that whole thing of like it. I feel like this movie really tackles addiction it well. Does. It it's does. not cartoonish, but it plays on those demons of temptation and how yes. fragile recovery can be, and how you really do need a support network of people in order to make your way back. It's a it's a really beautiful story, and it's yeah. like it's pretty much the whole film. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, like you said before, like the skirmishes are are slight, if anything. This is not wall-to-wall -wall action whatsoever, not wall-to-wall -wall tension. And yeah, I mean, the mean potatoes of this movie are these, are the men, are the men trying to figure themselves out and bond, whether it's Wayne up against his odds, knowing that the one person he can trust might not be reliable to trust because it's his, you know, his recovering friend. The friend is I, having all that guilt of like, really feeling it knowing he's in a tough place of trying to come through it knows he's probably letting his friend down um stumpy gets on his nerves a little bit you know here and there where uh, the pressures are coming from all places to perform or show up that he can and then i same thing like in, in a different movie 
Colorado would be here as like a rival where it would be like trying to steal some spot on a sports team kind of situation where that's not the case either. Like Colorado comes in and is, is in this posse or in this new group of lawmen where it's not showmanship in any kind of way. It's like, Hey, I, I can help you ride these demons with you too, or just figure this out. Like the camaraderie aspect is, is so strong. And then of course, from a sell tickets and impress the lady standpoint, you get the two, you know, you get the two golden voices to sing together. And that's kind of all you really need where by the time you get to that in the third act, all the women are like, this was the date movie I was ready for in 1958. Let's, let's go with the soda pop after this too, you know, that kind of thing. Dude, this is the date movie I was ready for in 2023. Like totally. when Dean Martin starts singing and then oh. Ricky Nelson accompanies on, on yep. guitar, <laughs> they do the one song. It's beautiful. Then they do a second song. Yep. I'm like, I want more out of genre musical interludes in yeah. my modern movies. Why not? <laughs> yeah. Like, um, and I think the rare times we get these are, nowadays are like, they feel so forced or it's just another big set piece. Like it's a karaoke scene somewhere or it's, um, you know, it's not just, yeah. Like, like it, today would be like singing in the car on the way to some commute where we're all together and it's sharing time and space. It, it could be done easier and simpler where I, yeah, this doesn't happen too often. It's the, it's probably what the kids putting on the radio and stand by me. It's yakety yak. It's, it's, it's I, not to call it, not to use the movie term. It's not diegetic by any means, but like the, the act to sing isn't for performance. It's for, we're hanging out together. This is what we would do if we hang out together, especially back then when there's, we're not checking our phones and looking down. So yeah. And, and Nelson, you know, coming into this movie, I know he was a child actor before this doing the Ozzy and Harriet show where um, I'm trying to think of like a comp today to like, what's the 18 year old that walks into a movie after being on TV and isn't given a part where all he has to do is look pretty and sing. Like he's given straight up substance to do in this movie and he and comports himself great as a first timer, probably because he's a trained young actor. But I don't I off the top of my head, I don't have a comp like of a person who made that leap. Like, I guess maybe Justin Timberlake or something, but, um, but even Timberlake is Timberlake was a huge recording star. Then went to movies where this kid went to movies and jumped to recording at the same time and then smoked them both. Yeah. I, I was I thinking about, I don't have a comp particularly for that, but I, it's yeah. weird because I was thinking if you were to remake Rio Bravo today, because mm. my idea of like, I don't care how much you pay people, you tell them, hey, you're going to watch a movie in a theater from 1958, 59. They'd be like, no. Um, so so you'd have yeah. to remake it. Yeah. I'm thinking I, I was casting some of the parts in my head. I was thinking Timothy Oliphant, because this movie, like the bones of Justified, which I didn't watch yeah. all of, but I watched a bit of it. I'm like, that's here. I, I figure he could play the Wayne character. Yep. that'd be He's the right age for it at this point. Yeah. I'm pegging Emily Blunt, you know, talk, going oh, back to yeah. Oppenheimer as Feathers, perfect. because I feel like she can play that independent. Mm -hmm. the, well, because she's also talked in interviews about how wow. she's tired of the independent, the strong, empowered woman trope in scripts. She like she yeah. rolls her eyes when she sees that in the description of a part she's about to read because she understands. I was listening to someone talk about Edge of Tomorrow earlier today mm. and how mm. that is another, you know, she kicks ass in that movie, but she's notably human and has romantic interests and that kind of yeah. thing. So I think she could pull it off. And then even though I don't like this actor <laughs> that okay. much, I want to see what Timothy Chalamet could do in the role of Colorado. Like, could this That's movie a... turn him into a man? Yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I accidentally, you know me, I don't watch trailers, but I accidentally watched the trailer to Wonka, whatever the fucking thing he's doing in November. And I'm watching him try to be, like in a period piece and um he looks like mila kunis to me where like <laughs> I, I, that's my that's my my that's my rationale and that's my litmus test is um when mila kunis did the book of eli with uh denzel washington like post-apocalyptic where you need to kind of be gritty and dirty and like there's no way you can dirty that girl up and there's also no way you can take the california out of that girl where she's gonna look like darlene no matter what movie you put her in <laughs> so like that's the thing with chalamet like i'm watching that wonka thing i'm like yeah, he's eccentric enough. He's got that young depth thing going on, but I watch him talk and he just doesn't have the, the, the quite the sparkle to be Wonka. Um, but like, yeah, you'd want an actor 
kind of yeah 18 if you can even go younger i probably one of these strange like today would probably be like finn wolfhard from stranger things some overexposed kid who we've seen in a couple of tv shows or whatnot i'm trying to think of somebody who's a singer who's that young and i'm not good at popular music and all that or who's a middle-aged singer who can play the martin part as the drunk and maybe that's now that he's 40 maybe that's justin timberlake next to a timothy oliphant or a Bradley Cooper or whoever you get to be the older sage no, gunman. Brad, you know? Bradley Cooper. You not you nailed it. To I be old to be the drunk. To be no, the drunk. no, no, no. Yeah. yeah, to yeah. Or I have we see... seen him have we unfortunately the other thing is we've seen him play the drunk thanks to a star is born. Where I'm trying to think of somebody who, like Martin, had never went dark. Like who's a guy we can tempt to go dark? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. here's the thing. I think he could I think I know he would play it. it. I think I think he can do it. I think he would play because the role calls for it, a different kind of drunk than he played in the Star is Born. This is I think he played it really well true, yeah. in that movie. But this the the story of uh, Rio. Uh, Bri, R oh, my God. Rio Bravo. I'm Rio Bravo. I want to say Rio Grand, but yeah, um, Rio Bravo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's got it's got a different it. it the demands are different story wise. Uh -huh. Um. All right, so we're off into fantasy football land. So we are, I think we, are, we can yeah. kind of do you have any kind of like closing thoughts on oh wait, I did have one thing I want to say before closing yeah. thought. John Wayne, you know, again, people have this popular conception of who he was, what kind of movies he made, and what the characters in those movies were. I was not ready for him to be the hero of the film, but yet be vulnerable in the sense that he has his ass handed to him on repeated mm -hmm. occasions. Yes, I don't know does. how many times he gets knocked out in this movie. There's a yeah. bit where he's in the upper floor of a hotel. He runs downstairs and the bad guys have tied a rope between the banisters. So he gets caught in it, trips up mm -hmm. and knocked out. It's, yeah. it's not that he's weak. It's just that he gets outsmarted by, you know, yeah. he's, he's very smart, but he's up against cunning people and yeah. lots of them. And so it's great to see this vulnerable hero who has to work his way. You know, he has to find a way to dominate these almost seemingly inominable forces. It's great. Yeah. No, the the extra thoughts I had were um, just some trivia tidbits I've learned along the way where uh, John Wayne apparently wore the same hat in every Western from 1939 Stagecoach to this movie. This was the last time he wore whatever is the same hat he does every single time. Um, the other thing was the original, the, the original choice that the filmmakers wanted to play the Colorado part was Elvis Presley. Um, he would have been a year after jailhouse rock. So it would have been a 25, 23 year old Elvis Presley where that, I mean that I don't, I think Ricky Nelson's kind of a better actor in the small sample than Presley, but I get the appeal there, you know, and it would have been, you know, I, again, I don't remember I have much context for Ricky Nelson aside from, yeah. I think his name was dropped during Pulp Fiction and the Jackrabbit Slim scene. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But I have seen some Elvis movies. I like him as an actor. I think I like the movies more than I liked him in them in some senses. Mm -hmm. But I feel like Elvis would have been too big a presence. Too he big. had too yeah, much yeah. of an, not that he was braggadocious, but that he has an air and attitude about him. Oh, yeah. Whereas Ricky Nelson he kind of has that Elvis look in the first couple mm -hmm. of scenes, but there is that kind of like team player humility in a way yeah. that I don't think Elvis, I, don't, I feel like they would have had to have rewritten the part because having him play that get a, you know, go along to get along part would have yeah. just been, people would have been like, wait, I thought this was the cool guy. <laughs> no. And word around the extra pieces of the trivia are apparently Colonel Parker, Elvis's manager wanted co-top billing next to Wayne and more stuff for him to do and obviously higher pay than a person like Ricky Nelson, where by that point, Elvis was a big timer enough that he would have muscled into this movie and made it probably like you're saying too big for the part that's supposed to be just kind of, no, just stay in your little third row lane. We got you a good part. That's not a naive part, but when we need you be cool. And he, and Ricky was so Elvis would be dialed the 12 the whole time. So, yeah, he wanted co-billing with uh, Wayne. John Wayne. Okay. Yeah. No, and no, because... one that. Yeah, <laughs> but but for just even in terms of just this movie, like the status, yeah. you got uh, the the character hierarchy. It's John Wayne, mm -hmm. Dean Martin. Yeah, you can even Stone. say Dean. I would even put well, Dean as a lead almost. Almost. I, I, I I would too. I mean, but yeah, that that would have been sacrilege. That would have been just yeah. weird. Well, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, a western, yeah. a big western with J starring Dean Martin with yeah. John Wayne. What? Um, 
Third billing, I got to give character wise just to Stumpy. Well, that's three time Oscar winner Walter Brennan. Like, that's no slouch playing Stumpy either, you know? I don't think what. Yeah, this is where my ignorance comes on it's full okay. display. I don't know who. Where have I seen this guy before? So Walter Brennan. Uh, let me let me dig up the the IMDb because he's one of only what three people in the world to win three Oscars. So um, Walter Brennan won his Oscars for it's coming right up. Voice face radio voice radio. Um, he won. He was a four time uh, all supporting actor. So he was a four time Oscar nominee. He won in 1941 for the Westerner and Gary Cooper show. Um, he won for uh, Kentucky in 1939, and he was the best supporting actor winner in 1937 for Come and Get It. So three Oscars in four years. This would be 17 years after that. So that's like casting. You know Morgan Freeman or Michael Caine today or something like that, but but the idea is like it's still three time Oscar winner Walter Brennan playing, you know Stumpy. So. Wow, I, I had yeah. no idea. Um, and he's great in this movie. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, like fourth billing, I I think is a tie between Angie Dickinson and you know and yeah. Ricky Nelson in terms yeah. of characters. Uh, and then you 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 still have um because uh, he's in every he's in every Wayne movie uh, and he's in the most movies in the AFI top one hundred. Oh, you still have Ward Bond coming in and playing the the stagecoach leader before his untimely death, but that's still like the Ward Bond where he's been in everything too. Oh yeah, um, yeah. What because he's in Searchers, just... he's in a zillion things. So I know, but I feel like we just talked about him in another movie, The Maltese Falcon. He's in the Maltese Falcon. You're right. right. He's the police investigator busting Pogart's balls. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also, it's a wonderful life. Um, yes. Yes. <laughs> playing yeah. Bert he's the in, cop. yeah. And that's that's kind of his claim to fame is like he's in the most movies on the AFI 100. That's like 12. Wow. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, sorry. I keep yeah. thinking about things I want to talk about. The supporting characters, um, mm -hmm. Pedro Gonzalez Gonzalez, which doesn't even yeah. sound like a real name, um, but he plays Carlos, the the hotel owner. It, uh -huh. It's strange because, again, I feel like this is where someone like a, a millennial or a zennial would watch this movie or hear about this movie, yeah. and they'd see like the supporting ethnic characters. You've got mm -hmm. the 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 Mexicans who kind of run the um, the hotel. You've got the the chinese guy who's the undertaker yeah, yeah. you you hear the thick accents and everything but again i i'm kind of getting into this with a lot of these historical pictures i'm, I'm watching i i don't know if they're actually racist portrayals or if they are um they're I, they're, I feel yeah. like they're earnest enough they do have yeah, you yeah. know kind of heavy accents and everything but i don't feel like they are you know meant to be stereotyped like imagine a, a Chinese immigrant well, or okay. a Mexican immigrant who's learned the language and is living out on the frontier. Yeah. Are they going to speak like John Wayne speaks? Or are they going to speak in their native exactly. language with a very heavy American or, yeah. uh, you know, flip that around as Wonka would say. Yeah, sure. No, I think, um, I think the fact that they're even in the movie and cast with ethnic actors for 1958 is a step and a half in a direction that wasn't getting stepped in back then. Right. Like this would get, this would be whitewashed played by a, an American actor. So the fact that you even have a Chinese actor of any descent playing the undertaker, even if it's meant to be the, the bit town part, and then you still have speaking lines and, and the closest thing we have to, I don't want to say comic relief, but a lighter part with, with Ricky there where, uh, yeah, I mean that that's the fact that they're even in the movie it is progressive enough for its era. Um, probably like we keep fantasy casting here. Probably today you'd make either Ricky Nelson or Dean Martin, a likely ethnic, you know, you would cast a minority next to your lead white guy, probably. So you, you'd, you'd yeah. pepper it in in more directions. So yeah. I, I can see that. Yeah. Um, and that's, okay. I would say like in terms of the Carlos character. Yeah. I, I, no, no yeah. objections really. But um, as far as the Carlos character, yeah, Carlos, it's like, easy. Ricky, my bad. Yeah. Well, it's but it's easy to look at um, that part as like, yeah, he's the he's the, the the little Mexican guy who runs the hotel. Yeah. But and if he were only in a couple of scenes, I would say, yeah, fair enough. But he becomes like, especially in the big shootout at the end, it's great because it's almost like an Avengers style team up where they all start oh. running, coming out of these portals from nowhere yeah. to help fight the big battle. You're like, it's wait, awesome. what's he doing here? What's he mm -hmm. doing here? And when Carlos shows up, you're like 
hell yeah, you realize he's been there throughout the film trying to yeah. help out in ways that he can while also protecting his is that his wife or the, the girl that he's interested in? Because he's like uh, buying her lingerie in the beginning of the movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that it's his wife or the girl he's sweet on. I, even if it is one of the per, you know performers at his place, um, I do believe that's his squeeze. Yeah. Yeah, but so like there's so many, even down to the the most bit characters, aside mm -hmm. from perhaps the Undertaker. But even I feel like even he gets a callback line, or or he yeah. is referred to later when uh chance like kills a whole bunch of people and says well we gotta <laughs> let the guy know um uh -huh. but there, there's so many i think well-rounded and developed enough characters in this almost two and a half hour movie that by the end of it i felt like i'd been watching a mini series and i just i didn't oh, yeah. want it to end i'm like okay yeah. where are these guys gonna be next week <laughs> yeah i mean this could be uh, a prestige cable like if you did uh you know an eight episode series on this like a mini series where each one was a day in this march for the week that'd be very compelling television with the right cast and right people and you obviously you need a little bit more filler in time like you need 48 minute you know you need seven to eight 48 minute things but there's scenes here i would expand like if you show a little more cards when you meet feathers maybe you have a little more singing and uh, you know you have a little more bonding episodes between the boys in you know around six or seven episodes in like before the big final showdown when everyone's deputized and hanging out maybe you get a stumpy backstory one episode something whatever you're like it can be done you know how do you get that how do you get that limp yeah you know <laughs> yeah, something, you know campfire stories it fills in the pieces you don't have here you know extend that coda the last episode and maybe extend the beginning with the coach or get a little more word bond in there this would totally play as an eight episode series so after the writers and the actors strike is over and the smoke oh, is cleared, uh, the yeah. gun smoke, as it were, uh, coming to AMC Rio Bravo, the uh, prestige yeah. drama. Yellowstone's um, washing the, I mean, it, I guess Westerns are kind of in a way back in, like, I don't know if anyone would want to do it, but it could be done. Somebody called Tyler, Taylor Sheridan, you know, yeah. but I would want it to be. Maybe this is where AI comes in. I don't really want uh, it to re be remade. I want I want these actors. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah, yeah. Let, let's get let's CGI them up now. Here we go. Yeah. Well, that's right, like well, um, or they if they silly like animated like when they do you remember Rango, the animated giant? Yeah, yeah, one? yeah. Where that mm -hmm. might as well be like every Western cool thing we've ever seen, but just animated on top of animals, you know. So we can knock things off in that way. Well. Speaking of knocking things off, uh -huh. that's a terrible transition. I don't know where I was going with well, it, but well, I'll, I'll work with it. Okay. Um, you, you're not knocking things off. You are building things up oh, in terms yeah. of, in terms of a library, a library of films. You're, you're, you're split, spreading knowledge to yeah. more generations of people and even maybe concurrent generations of people who haven't been able to experience all the movies currently inside your Free blockbuster, of yes. Elmwood, Elmwood Park, Illinois. Elmwood Don, Park, Illinois. Yeah, I I've been following this on Facebook and and uh -huh. all that stuff. Your your journey of bringing like I've seen these little libraries all over the yeah. place in different neighborhoods where you have like a little box like a latch on it and just people put books in there. You you take one, you 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 bring it back, maybe yeah. add your own so people can get educated on stuff. Mm -hmm. What inspired you to do the film version of this? I know other people sure. have done this in different other places have, around yeah. the country, but how? What? What's your story? How'd you get into this? Sure. So this is an absolute shout out to a former Chicago area critic who uh, is currently a radio DJ in Dubuque, Iowa. Shout out to Steve Pulaski of the Steve Pulaski Message Boards and uh, he and of of Influx Magazine. Uh, Steve, um, when he moved out of Chicago and got a radio gig out of college working in LaSalle, Peru, halfway across between here and Iowa, he started one of these in LaSalle, Illinois. And uh, he, it's one of those things where um, there is like a um, kind of a central group of people who set up these little franchises, give you the templates of the, for the stencils and the little instructions of if you want to make one, seek this out, do it in this way. Uh, they've even gotten to the point where they'll make their own boxes and sell them to you for like 300 bucks where I wasn't going to do that. But, um, but when Steve set this up, one of the things that kind of made it more uh, involved than just throwing it out there and hoping it does this thing is um, you make an Instagram account for it and you kind of, you kind of, you know, play the Instagram game of like behaving like the box of like, hey, this week we've got Christmas in July or something like that. So you kind of just make it a social media engagement thing. But um, but no, you described it perfectly. It's a um, it's like the little libraries where it's give a movie, take a movie. Um, and I have um, 
And me and I've been wanting ever since Steve did this, and this must be about five, six years ago. Once Steve did it, I'm like, man, I, I would love to do that now. But I had never had a really good place to put one of these things uh, where I'm, I'm just in my second year of owning a home for the first time and the only time I'll ever own a home um, where um, I've been looking like on Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist for like an old like newspaper dispenser something that's tough enough they can sit outside or handle the elements and still hold movies. I've just not found one or not found any close where Elmwood Park, my local town and community, um, they were um, refurbishing their existing little library that was from one of the parks where they were putting a tougher and stronger, newer one in, but they were kind of like giving away their old one. And I'm like, my wife snagged it for free and I, and she, cause she knew I told her, Hey, once we own a home, I'm going to make one of these damn boxes. So, um, and she's like, and she was, I, I thought for sure my wife would be like, don't you dare put that eyesore in our lawn. Uh, but, she, <laughs> but she's like, no, nope. she was all for it. So once we found the box um, and was free, which was great. Um, the rest was just a super smooth sailing where um, it was, Take your box, finish it, complete it, register it on free Rockbusters website. That way you're in their little network. Make your own little Instagram account. And as long as you've got some movies, um, it, it just kind of, yeah, just upkeep the box, throw some things in. Um, and I've got about a shelf over there of about, I don't know, um, in the box right now, there's probably about a dozen and a half movies. Uh, but I have a, a kind of a stash or a, a you know, a, closet inventory of about oh probably about 150 movies where i'm completely slow playing what goes out there because more often than not more leave than come back but honestly like you said it's more than anything just you know, share a little culture share a little entertainment in the neighborhood it doesn't matter if it's dvds blu-rays vhs we, we take it all i even have two um hand-me-down free blue uh dvd players where if someone even needs the device to run the show i'm gonna start putting those in the boxes so uh, yeah, it's just been super fun, super cool. Now it's this community landmark where they're like, well, that's where the Shanahan's house is at. It's the one with the dumb <laughs> blockbuster in the lawn. So all of my kids at school friends know what it is. Um, my kids are like the little assistant managers where they're uh, they're completely invested in it and dorks about it. And they, they tell all their friends about it. And in our little community, like it makes it into the community pages and all that. So it's got a nice little following. I think we got like 170 Instagram followers or something like that. It's just adorable. I, I love it. It's 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 I don't, just a crafty dorky thing to do and yeah wow that's that's really cool now can you fit a blu-ray or a dvd player into the box uh, it's going to be a test um and if i can't i won't and i'll just you know e-cycle these things in because in some place else but uh i've seen some free blockbuster boxes that have like an extra trade that they'll put the the players in but i don't i can't quite craft all that i'm not very handy but uh um and maybe get like like working. a milk you can probably go like a milk crate or something and put it in there just like underneath yeah. until it's gone or something. Yeah. yeah. I, I, there's well, the element are what worries me the most is like, it's more the rain. It's the, just the rain and the snow at some point. So, Oh yeah. Um, but it's been up since May and it's, it's, it's kicking great. People love it. So um, I have a little, um, I have like a ring camera on my front window that watches the box just to not from a vandalism standpoint or a security standpoint, but it's just fun to see how many people, actually stop and look we've quite we have quite the dog walking street where we get we get pretty good little traffic for not being a downtown street so it's adorable yeah do you get and not to be like again we're not trying to be voyeurs or anything but yeah do you know do you have like regular customers do you oh you, is there like oh there's there's jim he's always like borrowing yeah. stuff but then he returns like three movies and, and that kind of thing um, haven't quite caught those trends yet or stalked people to that extent, but, uh, <laughs> I think that's a good plan. Um, I'm very curious how this is going to work. Like in the winter, um, we, again, again, we have everyone's walking dogs at some point where, but I know traffic's going to drop come like December. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's, that's really cool and yeah. inspiring. And I, I don't know if I'm following you. I, I got to fix that. And, and folks out yeah. there. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'll leave all the information there, and yep. and you know the the free blockbuster website and, mm -hmm, and all that mm -hmm. good stuff. In addition to to your various outlets, you Don, we're gonna push the five thousand character limit on the uh, YouTube post for sure. Whew. All right, but um, no, this has been great. I, I really appreciate you um, talking Rio Bravo with me. I, I again, this is out uh, from Warner Brothers right now on 4K. Mm -hmm. It's light on extras, but the one it is it yeah. does have. Is an audio. I don't know if this is new or a legacy thing, but it's, it's audio a legacy commentary. It yeah. Okay. Between critic Richard Schickel and John Carpenter. John 
Carpenter, folks. Yeah, it's it is a carryover from the DVD days. Um, I looked this up because I had to write a piece, like a disc review piece for the, for my outlet that I write on, kind of as proof of like that I'm doing something by getting these free things from yeah. Warner Brothers. Right. So, um, like us doing this show right now. Um, <laughs> but no, um, the previous Blu-ray and DVD editions of this movie that are like two discs deep have like all kinds of extra EPK things. But this commentary has been there for a while. I have not listened to it yet, but I'd be fascinated because. Like just just to hear Carpenter distill a Western would be kind of amazing. And also to find out, like, I mean, the answer is probably obvious to like diehard Carpenter fans out there. But mm -hmm. why is he commenting on this movie? What was it that spoke to him mm -hmm. that maybe informed stuff that he did? I mean, of course, he did Assault on Precinct 13. And, yeah. you know, he does a lot of kind of he has done a lot of siege movies, even if they're just like, oh, there's a killer coming into the house. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's something to check out for sure. So. I got to listen to it. Um, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, folks out there can definitely check that out. Uh, it's at fine retailers near you, as it were. That's but right. uh, Don, you were a fine film critic. I'm, I'm glad to know you and call you my friend. And I'm going to prove how much of a friend I am by giving you the rest of your Friday night back. I definitely appreciate Woo! this. <laughs> and we'll be talking about more uh, stuff in the very near future. So Don Shanahan of Film Obsessive and Every Movie Has a Lesson and the Cinephile Hissy Fit podcast. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, thank you so much. Um, and yeah, anything else you want to plug or let us know that is going on? Uh, free Blockbuster Enwood Park periods between all the words on Instagram. Okay, sir. Well, till next time, whenever that is, whatever that is, thanks very much and take care, sir.